Today's seminar, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Simon Newman. Simon is Emeritus Professor at the University of Glasgow and also Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for Research in the Humanities at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I believe he is joining us from uh, Madison today, the civilised time of 11.30 in the morning. So Simon is going to be talking to us today about Freedom Seekers, um, a book that he recently published with the University of London Press. And um, I believe some more of the sort of um, processes of responding to the work um, in that book. So, uh, Simon, please do make a start. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation to speak with you um, and to join you all. I look forward to our conversation. I'll start by sharing my screen and putting up my PowerPoint presentation. Can everyone see that okay? Great. Okay. Um, for most of my career, I've researched and written about early modern North American and Caribbean history. 20 years ago, I first wrote about enslaved people who escaped in a book about the bodies of the poor in late 18th century Philadelphia. And I became fascinated by the newspaper advertisements describing these freedom seekers. Between the early 18th century and 1865, tens of thousands of these advertisements appeared in American newspapers. And I often use these in teaching on both sides of the Atlantic. But even though I was English and I'd studied English history in school, and I was teaching in the history department of one of Britain's ancient universities, when I published that research, I had no idea there had been so many freedom seekers and newspaper advertisements for them in British newspapers. I first learned of Scottish examples from John Cairns, a legal historian at the University of Edinburgh, who is an expert on Scots law and slavery. I started looking and once I realized how many advertisements survived, I decided to find as many as I could, make them available to researchers and research and write about them myself. I was fortunate enough to receive a major research grant from the Levy Hume Trust to support the project. And in 2018, I launched the project website and database featuring nearly 900 advertisements published in English and Scottish newspapers between 1700 and 1780, as well as several dozen advertisements offering and save people for sale. I had set 1700 as the nominal start date because I knew that the first American and Caribbean runaway advertisements had been published in 1704, pretty much when the first newspapers are published in the Americas. And I assumed that white colonists had brought back to Britain the knowledge and practice of writing and placing these newspaper notices. I was wrong. As I continued researching, I realized, in fact, that there were runaway slave advertisements published in English newspapers that predated the first American and Caribbean advertisements. Eventually, I found 151 advertisements for African or South Asian people who escaped between 1655 and 1704, all of them published in London newspapers, all of them appearing before the appearance of the very first runaway advertisement in North American and Caribbean newspapers. Now, for me, this was, was mind blowing. It meant that runaway advertisements were created in London and then were later copied by British colonists. But it also meant that slavery was real and present in London much earlier and on a much larger scale than I and other historians have realized. For me, it was an exciting discovery. My family all came from the East End of London and I'd never realized that the American and Caribbean history of resistance to slavery I had been researching and teaching for decades had a crucial early London chapter. I developed two objectives, to write the history of these freedom seekers and to find ways of communicating this history to broader public audiences. If I, as a, as a historian of the subject, hadn't really known much about this, then I assumed that the, the broader public knew even less. Researching and writing about London's early modern freedom seekers is really challenging. In most cases, the only surviving record of the existence of an early, of an enslaved person in early modern London is the newspaper advertisement written by an enslaver when they escape. Take this one, for example, published in the London Gazette in December of 1700. And I'll read it. I know it's on the screen, but it bears reading. A Negro named Quashi, aged about 16 years, belonging to Captain Edward Archer, run away from Bell Wharf, the 25th instant, having on a plush cap with black fur, a dark waistcoat, a speckled shirt, old Kalamanka breeches, branded on his left breast with EA, 
but not plain, and shaved round his head. Whoever brings him to Mr. Roland Tryon in Lime Street, or to Mr. Richard Clark at Bell Wharf in Shadwell, shall have a guinea reward and charges. The 78 words of this advertisement may, may well be the only surviving record of Quashie's very existence. They identify him as property rather than as an in individual, and other than his name, his age, the rough clothing he wore, and the initials of his owner branded onto his breast, we know nothing about him. It took me several years of broad and deep research into a whole array of sources in order to be able to uncover at least a little of the histories of people like Quashie. I had to search the needles in many different haystacks, looking through such sources as parish records, governmental records, correspondence and diaries, maps and geographic descriptions and sources like John Scribe's updated edition of John Stowe's Survey of London and many other materials. Moreover, I had to read between the lines of the advertisements, discerning meaning from what was implicit in or absent from these notices. In the case of Quashi, I could begin with his name. It's an Akan day name, indicating that he had almost certainly been born on a Sunday somewhere here on the Gold Coast of West Africa in one of the Akan speaking communities. He escaped, or at least he tried to, resisting his enslavement by eloping on Christmas Day in London, a long way from the Gold Coast. When this newspaper advertisement appeared, it, it was published five days after Quashi escaped, indicating he was still free. The very existence of the advertisement suggests the agency and individuality of a teenage boy from Africa who was willing to assert his right to mastery over his own body by stealing himself away. Captain Edward Archer was the man who claimed ownership of Quashi and whose initials were painfully branded onto the teenager's breast, imposing the identity of enslaver upon enslaved. Archer lived by Bell Wharf on the eastern edge of Shadwell in London's East End, and it was from Bell Wharf the Quashi escaped. This fast growing area of London was defined by the ocean going ships moored on the Thames, and it was filmed, filled with the homes of seafarers and their families, all of the industries associated with building and outfitting ships, and the taverns and businesses that supported this community. Within a few blocks were taverns such as the King of Denmark and the King of Sweden, as well as Blackamoor Alley, Parrot Alley, Sugar House Yard, and Tobacco Alley all testifying to the cosmopolitan nature of the area, its inhabitants, and the goods and people they transported. Now, many advertisements, like the one for Koshi, indicate where the freedom seeker had escaped from. And this map shows those locations over time. And as you'll see when the map ends and all of them are brought together, a significant proportion of freedom seekers escaped from the riverside communities of the East End and to a lesser extent, the South Bank, as well as the city itself. For at least some of his career, Archer was a slave ship captain. It's likely that in late 1696 or early 1697, Quashi, who would then have been about 12 years old, was taken from a Gold Coast trading post, such as Cape Coast Castle, and loaded onto Archer's ironically named ship, the Happy Return. It was a fairly small slave ship. This is a much later one, but of a similar size, fewer than 100 tons, and 122 enslaved souls were packed tightly between the decks. And this is the record of that voyage on the Slave Voyages database. Now, of the 122 people, who's enslaved people who were on this ship, only 98 survived the Middle Passage, a mortality rate of about one fifth. Most of the 98 were sold to Barbados planters, but Koshi might have been retained by Archer as a favorite. As captain, he was entitled to ship and sell or keep at least one enslaved people for, person for his own profit. The newspaper advertisement in December 1700 did not, as was common, state that Koshi had run away from his master and could be returned to him, instead stating that the teenager belonging to Captain Edward Archer had run away from Bell Wharf. The wording makes more sense when we realize that Archer had actually sailed from London on 29th of November, almost a month earlier, on another slave ship, the Mayflower, which like the Happy Return was destined for West Africa and then Barbados. Why didn't Koshi accompany Archer? 
Did the captain not trust the young boy? Did he want to protect him from the diseases and the horrors of this deadly voyage? Perhaps, and I think most likely of all, Archer didn't want Koshi occupying valuable space and he intended to acquire and then either keep or sell another enslaved person for himself on this voyage. Perhaps the teenager was unhappy enough to escape or perhaps Archer's absence gave him the opportunity, we don't know. We can only guess at the circumstances and causes of his bid for freedom at this point. It may be that he was being treated poorly by those who ruled him in Archer's absence. Maybe Archer had denied him the opportunity to sail back to West Africa. Perhaps he simply missed the captain, and this isn't as strange as it, as it may initially sound. It's quite possible that during four years of captivity, Koshi had developed a bond with Archer. Later, Lado Equiano's autobiography shows that enslaved boys and young men could become very close to the ship's officers who claimed ownership of them. Indeed, having sailed on a middle passage ship, having seen the horrors below decks, as well as the terror of those uh, they ex the enslaved people experienced on their arrival in the Caribbean, perhaps after all of this, Koshi did feel some measure of gratitude to a man who had apparently saved him from the worst of all of this. If Koshi did feel such affection, it was quite likely a manifestation of something approximating Stockholm syndrome. Enslavement and sale in West Africa, the Middle Passage and exposure to Caribbean plantation slavery must surely have had a deeply traumatic effect on boys like Koshi when they ended up in London. Given Archer's absence, the advertisement gave two other names and locations where anybody who recaptured Koshi might take him and receive the significant reward of one guinea. How ironic that the price of his freedom was a coin named for the gold taken from his West African homeland and bearing the Royal African Company's emblem of a castle and a West African elephant. By 1700, perhaps as, many, as much as a quarter of a million pounds worth of West African gold poured out of the continent and into Western Europe each year. And the profits of the slave trade filled the purses of those in England who held these small gold coins. Now this map shows the locations in the East End to which escaped runaways might be returned as specified in the newspaper advertisements. One of the contacts named in the advertisement was Richard Clark, again on Bell Wharf in Shadwell. He was quite possibly Quash's master during Archer's absence. I found it all but impossible to identify Richard Clark. He may have been a mariner of that name, Perhaps he was a tavern or an innkeeper, or perhaps he was one of the area's numerous craftsmen and tradesmen. Given that Quashi was reported to have escaped from Bell Wharf, and this was Clark's address, Quashi had almost certainly been living and working in Clark's home. The areas of the East End and the South Bank closely associated with ship construction, ship maintenance, and all of the industries associated with maritime activities provided, as you can see here, venues for the return of freedom seekers. The other person and location to which Quashi could be returned was Roland Tryon on Lime Street in the city of London. We know a little more about Try the Tryons. They were a well-known mercantile family in the city of London with connections to the Caribbean. Earlier in the mid 1690s, Roland Tryon could be found in the lists of tax paying property owners in Stepney, which was adjacent to Shadwell. And perhaps this was how he he had become acquainted with Archer and Clark. But by this point, 1700, Tryon was listed as a church warden for St. Dionys Black Church on Lime Street, the address mentioned in this advertisement. Tryon appears to have been a merchant specializing in trade with Barbados. His uncle Thomas had spent five years as a merchant in Barbados, and Roland Tryon was himself in Barbados when he died two decades later. A wealthy and successful man, the trade in enslaved people and what they produced had enabled Tryon to indulge himself by, amongst other things, subscribing to the first Octavo edition of the Tatler. It was well to do. Now, this map shows the locations in the city of London to which escaped freedom seekers might be returned. It's clear that the return of recaptured enslaved people was fairly routine here, amidst the coffee houses, the imperial offices and administrative centers, the Royal Exchange, and the headquarters of both the Royal African Company and the East India Company. Returning to Quashi and to Archer, Tryon and Clark, 
But perhaps what is most important about these people in this one advertisement is how this example illustrates how deeply racial slavery had already permeated London. Archer, Tryon and Clark were part of a large complex of aristocrats, gentlemen, merchants, craftsmen, ship captains and others who made possible the trade in enslaved people and the goods they produced. In London, these people were efficiently networked and when Quashi escaped, the network went into action as this advertisement suggests. We know that the young freedom seeker was free for at least five days. It's possible he escaped permanently. We just don't know. Now this map shows the baptisms, marriages and burials of people of color in London as revealed in parish records in which race was recorded. There were almost certainly more examples but the, the people baptized, married or buried weren't always, uh, their race was not always acknowledged. But it does show that London was more racially diverse than we sometimes appreciate with the developing black communities shown here spread all over the city. And as will become clear by the end of this map when all of the examples show, while freedom seekers tended to run away from concentrations in the city of London in the East End and the South Bank and could be returned to those areas, the black community as a whole, many of these people are free, um, is, is spread far more broadly across the city. Now, the gender balance of these people revealed in these church records is slightly more even uh, than the runaway records. The church records show 76% male and 24% female. In contrast, the newspaper advertisements for people who have escaped between 1655 and 1704 reveal 94% to have been male. This imbalance is partly explained by the greater difficulties facing females, but also by the fact that young boys dominated the ranks of London's enslaved. 62% of male escapees who, whose ages were specified were no older than 19, and a shocking 15% were 12 or younger. There were opportunities for free boys and young men of color as personal servants to those who could afford such living emblems of colonial power and success, or as sailors on board slave and trade ships. With a degree of immunity to the tropic diseases that lay waste to English sailors in West Africa and the Caribbean, young and healthy black sailors were very popular recruits for these voyages. In the final analysis, all that we can be sure of is that slavery existed in London in the later 17th and 18th century, but so too did resistance. And I think the, the extent of the black community here, many of these people free shows that. For those who escaped, if only for a few hours or days, children and men and women of color, these are people who sought freedom from enslavement in the imperial metropolis. We know little of their fate, but while some and perhaps many were recaptured or forced into servitude, others may have secured liberty. But to my frustration, and despite all of my research, I really knew nothing substantial about Kwashi and most of these freedom seekers. What had his life been like in Africa? Where exactly did he come from there? What of his, his family in Africa, his culture, his food ways and so forth? How had he experienced enslavement and the Middle Passage? And what about his life in London and how the city appeared to him? Did he form friendships with other Africans perhaps or even with white Londoners and perhaps with both? Did such people aid his escape? I will never be able to answer these questions. I will never really know Quashi or any of the other London freedom seekers I've been investigating. And I began to realize why these people effectively became invisible and all but disappeared from historical and popular knowledge of early modern London. This speaks to what scholars have referred to as the silence and the violence of the archive, the ways in which records created by enslavers, such as ship manifests, plantation account books, and other records, dehumanized and itemized enslaved people as nameless property. The enslaved's voices, their stories, and their very humanity were erased. When these kinds of historical records are insufficient, all that is left to us is to research as best we can and then imagine the people we have investigated and their interior worlds. But as an older white British man, I don't think I can presume or even should attempt to imaginatively inhabit the mental and physical world of an enslaved black person in early modern London. 
I decided to build on work I had done in Scotland with young black filmmakers, composers, a dramatist and a graphic novelist. I was eager to work with young black and South Asian Londoners, introducing them to a history I suspected they knew little about and sharing with them my research so that they could think about and examine the people in their city who challenged slavery by escaping. I believe, believed that black creative artists could help imagine lost histories in ways that broaden and deepen knowledge and understanding of a largely forgotten past. Poetry, literature, and art can creatively fill these spaces of elision and silence. Working with these young creative artists promised to imaginatively fill some of the archival silences of those who resisted slavery in London, as well as enabling these creative artists to take ownership of their community's London history. Here are two of the poets addressing this in an extract from a short film about the project. I think it's important that the stories are told because in my experience and in my education, they haven't been told. And whilst there may not be a lot of information on the lives of these people as poets, I would hope that we are able to take that and we are able to imagine something which bears some relation or some closeness to the lives that they lived. It's really important that this project and this whole, you know, these poems, this research serves as a pointing for the UK to kind of confront the history. This has been one of the most exciting and fulfilling things I've ever done, even though it meant abandoning control of my research and moving away from the comfort of academic historical research and writing and entering the unfamiliar world of art and creative writing. I collaborated with friends at London's Spread the Word, a writer development organization that works in particular with black and Asian writers, and Ink, Sweat and Tears, a London-based poetry webzine. I translated my research into a portfolio of materials for the creatives, the writers and artists. This included primary sources and a brief historical analysis of London and England in the 17th and 18th centuries, information about how slavery worked in the British Isles and about how free and enslaved people of color lived in the capital. The completed dossier included several case studies, each beginning with a several advertisement for one freedom seeker, and then developing contextual information about the enslaver, other people mentioned in the advertisement, the nature of the London location specified in the text, and whatever could be surmised about the freedom seekers themselves. We commissioned seven poets and artists, all united by the fact that they were unaware or barely aware of the presence of enslaved Black and South Asians in 17th and 18th century London. Here are the same two poets discussing how they approached the research and data and then imagined the people behind the advertisements. A specific motivation behind my poems has been to name the people, to give them back something which they had taken from them through the process of enslavement and also in the ways that they were written about in the adverts. Most often their names weren't included, but they were referred to by what they looked like or who they belonged to. So I was interested in, in some way, returning to them a personhood which had been strict if she appears wanting of a name, refusing English, if she has a mark on her face, belonging to her country, itself wanting of a name, forehead resembling flower, blooming, heading eastward still, escort back 40 shillings. One of the first stories that resonated was Sabina's story. Um, I remember specifically in her advertisement, it said that she had been deluded away by some blacks. And I found that very striking, the language of it. Of course, it like all of the language and all the advertisements were quite violent in nature, just calling for the return of people who were essentially property. But it was just that that particular line really stuck out, stood out to me because I just found it alarming that it was made to seem like she was almost crazy for running away, for seeking out her freedom. But I think for me, then what resonated and what clicked was the idea of community, the idea that there was a rich community of Black people, of enslaved people who had sought out their freedom in London, who were there supporting one another. 
Song of brass horns is rich, dancing through my scalp. He shaved my coils, but they are growing. Black hands, black hands grasping music. Black eyes are wide eyed. I rest my eyelids, listen to the swell of thudding drum, beating, beating. We are so many, grinning teeth, tightly packed but upright. Yellow glow kissing the cheeks of everything. I find the results really powerful. A poem or an artistic work is a break in the archival silence that grabs its reader or viewer and demands their attention. A poem or an image is urgent and personal and it has the freedom to imagine what was and what could have been. The writers and artists took this approach to the project and imagined the lives that eluded historians like me, hampered by archival silences, while all the while recognizing the limits of what can never be known. They asked what happened and who it happened to and when it happened, but crucially they asked, how did it feel? That's the question that I, as a historian, struggle to answer. The reward of imaginative historical work by creatives inc includes the ability to find an emotional resonance with the reader as well as an intellectual one, so that historians, curators, institutions, and the general public are collectively engaged in a project to better understand the people of our past. My research into London's 17th and 18th century freedom seekers required me to really get to know the early modern city, its people and places and the rhythms of life. But I believe that it was only through collaboration with these young poets and artists that together we were able to glimpse the people in that city who resisted slavery by escaping. I'll end with some of the images created by the project's artists. Tazia Graham tried to recapture the full range of freedom seeker experiences, all the while trying to avoid romanticizing the trauma. In many ways, the most powerful of her images is the final one. After, in the earlier images, showing life in Africa, enslavement and the Middle Passage, and then slavery in London, and then echoing those in the, the final image, Graham focuses in that last image on an older free Black woman in London entitled British with a loss of identity. In Graham's words, this woman has to face the fact that she may be Black British, but she is not viewed as a citizen due to the color of her skin, nor does she identify with the culture she once had. This illustration depicts the confusion and the loss of African identity that many Black British people face today with a loss in their culture and who they really are through the effects of slavery. Olivia Twist's artwork highlights all that is strong and positive in the lives of the freedom seekers. Focusing on little snippets of information in the advertisements um, and some of my larger research, she saw proud assertions of individuality, identity, and community, perhaps it's best expressed in an image of a black tav owned tavern and the so-called black balls that took place in these kinds of locations. But for me, the most powerful and evocative of twist paintings is the one we used as the cover for our book of poems and art, showing a stylized map of East London covered with black faces past and present. Several of the poets and artists were determined to affirm not only that black history should be remembered and included in our larger national nar narrative, but that Black history is London history and is English history. And they worked with us to create resource packs and assignments to be used in schools so that school teachers could use the advertisements, talk about their history, but also manage to develop creative assignments themselves. Slavery first took off in a big way in England's colonies during the 1650s, when the development of sugar agriculture and processing in Barbados called for large numbers of workers. Almost immediately, enslaved people were brought to London, and almost immediately they escaped. In many ways, this is a history in which London is the most important character of all. And while I tried to discern where freedom seekers were, their routes to freedom, and the concentrations of enslavers, of enslaved, and of free people, the poets and the artists brought their knowledge and experience of contemporary Black and Asian London. And they imagined the world that was, the Black Londoners who challenged their enslavement. Thank you. I will stop. Thank you so much, Simon. That was absolutely astounding. Mm -hmm. uh, really, really wonderful paper. And so many comments, so many questions, I'm sure, from, from all of us. Um, if, if nothing else, 
I was so glad that you mentioned that you've been creating teaching resources because all the way through this, I was thinking of the ways <laughs> that I would have loved to have been able to use these resources while I was still teaching undergraduates um, mm. and just how much it would respond to the to what the students I was teaching wanted to be able to do in their work. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, I'll give people in the audience a, a few moments to come up with questions. Remember that you can either type a question into the chat, myself or Adam will um, retrieve that, or you can raise your hand and then we'll ask you to unmute um, to ask your question. There were two phrases though, Simon, that you mentioned that really resonated as you said them, and I'm not sure which of them are to go with first. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps most striking to me is when you said that engaging in the, the work, the artistic work, meant you losing control of your research. But that was, to paraphrase maybe what you said, one of the best things mm -hmm. that you'd done. Um, I wonder if you could reflect a little more on what you felt that meant for your practice and what advice you might give others um, who might be contemplating working in that kind of way. Thank you. I think that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, I, it started in Scotland when we were in, in an earlier incarnation of the project when we were looking at Scottish runaways, freedom seekers. Um, we secured funding to create a graphic novel based on three imagined stories of, Scot of real Scottish runaways. Um, and then we got funding to put 35 copies of that graphic novel in every secondary school in Scotland with teaching resources, which, and um, realizing how much more creative writers, artists, uh, playwrights, or uh, people can do with the material I had than I could do. Um, that, yeah, I've spent my life trying to write the histories of, of lower sort people for whom there are a few records, and I've got, I hope I've gotten reasonably good at it, but I recognize my limits. Um, but it was the first time I'd ever surrendered my material and become really I'd done the research, but in the, end, in the end, I became a research assistant to other people who did things with the work that I couldn't do myself um, because it's not my trade, it's not my craft. Um, and that was terrifying at first. Um, I suspect most of us feel this way, um, that this is our work. Sometimes you spend years in the archive, you spend years working on this and developing your interpretation and argument, and we, are very proprietary about our material. Handing it over to someone else and say, it's yours now, just ask me questions when you need to, um, was really difficult. But then when I saw what was created, and more than that, when I saw how people reacted to these creations, I thought I could never reach these kinds of audiences. I could never affect people. And if my research can help develop those kinds of effects, then why wouldn't I want to do this? So it really was a, it was a journey of discovery, uh, to use a cliche. Um, I would highly recommend it to anyone. Thank you. That, that is a really, really powerful point. Reminds me actually of conversations with Tim Hitchcock about the similar frustration of mm -hmm of wanting to recover the experiences and lives of, of people who are silenced by the archives in these ways. Um, and perhaps interesting to reflect on directions he's taken, sort of using 3D reconstructions of spaces and things as perhaps a technological answer to that. But mm -hmm. I think your your pitch for an artistic approach is, uh, is, is very compelling. Thanks. Uh, so Jenny has a question. Um, hi, thank you for that presentation, Simon. It was uh, really great. Um, so I have a question sort of building on that, which is the way you talk about handing your work over. Um, obviously you were there to ans answer questions, 
But I'm wondering um, if you see that as sort of a collaboration. It seems to me that there's a little bit of a difference in what you're saying. Um, I'm doing a project here, which has been entirely collaborative, working on enslaved people at the University of Alabama. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been one of the really amazing things, right? Because obviously when we're doing our own work, I always think of it as somewhat collaborative, right? Except usually the end product just has our name on it, even though we've had input from loads and loads of people along the way. And one thing that I've really enjoyed doing the project I've been working on at the moment is really feeling like there's lots of cooks in the kitchen. <laughs> And I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit on, mm -hmm. um, I suppose, whether you see what you're doing as really being the research assistant, right? So mm -hmm. doing the work and it's collaborative in that way, but whether or whether you see it as entirely sort of integrated and that you also then, I suppose the second part of the question is, is there a way that you are able to return to your materials, see them differently and perhaps do something that is not crossing those lines that I understand very clearly that you don't want to cross, but that allows you then to do different kind of interpretive work that we could say is fully the work of the historian as opposed to the work of the artist. Right. Um, thank you, Jenny. It's nice to see you. Um, I, I realized it was, a, a as I say, it was a learning experience for me when I, when we started, it was in the height of the pandemic. And so everything was being done on Zoom and we, the people from Spread the Word and Ink, Sweat and Tears, and the Ink, Sweat and Tears intern, who is a young man who is of African descent, who has a degree in African imperial uh, history from SOAS, but is also now a creative writer. Um, we had these Zoom meetings. I gave them, given them information. I was available individually or to a, a, to a group to talk with them. But we had these Zoom meetings and they were all very quiet all the time. Um, and they talked a little about the power dynamics. And um, we then set it up so that they could meet with the project intern, so African, and none of the white people, myself included, were there. And then it all opened up. I mean, I wasn't part of it, but I, I've heard about it from, from the intern. Um, who's a co-editor of the, the book we did. Um, some of their poems talk very much about the present day and it, its connection to this past. There's a poem about someone running from the police out of Liverpool Street Station and how running away in the 17th century was happening exa in exactly the same places and what has changed and about the power dynamics and the experience of race in past and present and how they come together. They were able to talk about that in different ways and think about it um, in ways that were different. If I was present too much as a senior white male academic, it changed the dynamic. So that's what I meant about having to surrender my material and step away and out of the process. And I think that liberated them to do what they wanted with it. Um, but you're quite right that letting them do that has changed what I felt able to do um, and how I could think about my own research. Um, even if I, I still, I wasn't gonna start putting lots of fiction, which I didn't feel able to write in my book, I could still imagine and conceptualize it differently. So it did, there is a feedback. Thank you, yeah. And I think one of, one of the poems from this process is a preface in your yes. book, it's, yeah. I think that's a really nice encapsulation of that, isn't it? Um, I know David Killing, Killing Gray, did you did you mean to clap or put your hand up to ask a question earlier? I think you're still muted, I'm afraid. David, you, you're still muted. David, um, I can see you're asking your question, but... I'm you... unmuted. There we are. There we are. Right. <clears throat> Simon, thank you so much for your book. I found it a rich and rewarding read, and I've recommended it to a good number of colleagues and friends, um, which uh, perhaps endorses that a little bit further. Can I ask you one or two questions about the source material? Um, the first question is that notices of black runaways, whether servants or slaves, and we don't know 
the difference between them in some of the notices. How do those compare with similar notices which were also printed in the press for white servants who had run away? That's the first question. Uh, the second question is that slavery certainly existed, but it's ambiguous in London <clears throat> in the late 17th and the 18th century. Is there any way of knowing how many of the runaways were actually labeled slaves? I did a quick count of the, uh, which probably wasn't a very scientific way of doing it, the um, Glasgow project. Mm -hmm. And I, it was certainly under 20%, nearer to 17%, I think, of those that could be identified, either because they'd been branded or because they were labeled in such a way that might indicate um, that, that, that's <clears throat> And the third question is about how does one put this in the context of labor law of the late 17th century, the early 18th century, mm -hmm. which seems to me to be quite an important element to this. And yet it wasn't something that you mentioned in the book. Mm -hmm. There are all good questions. Um, OK, I'll try and go through them in order. The, Difference between advertisements for enslaved people or people of color and uh, white servants. And of course, it's not just white servants, there are also advertisements for military deserters and, mm -hmm. and others. Um, especially in the 17th century, um, but also continuing in the 18th century, my sense, not just from the newspapers, but from my reading in the secondary literature, is that domestic and household servants run away all the time uh, that this is just i mean peep's diary is is a very good source for this and he's constantly complaining about people who leave before the end of their contract um fortunately there is a, a huge source of set of, of people to work so sometimes it's a bit troubling to get a really good cook or something like this but servants can be replaced um given how many are escaping all of the time it's surprising how small the number of, advertis of advertisements for servants is. Um, and as I look at them in the newspapers, not always, but in many cases, they are only advertised for if they steal property when they leave. So it's actually about theft and a crime. Um, that's what the advertisement is really about. I think in many cases, the person advertising doesn't necessarily want that servant back. They want the property back and perhaps even have the person prosecuted. Um, the runaway slaves or the people of color, they, some do take property with them and sometimes stolen property is mentioned, but in a lot of cases it isn't. The person has stolen themselves. That's the theft. Um, so that's the primary difference I, I see most often. Um, and there are similarities between the advertisements. But there's also, there, there are those differences, and there are the differences in, way, in the ways in which the people are described and explained. The servants are fellow members of the white race. They may be members of a lower social class, but they are given full names, and the ways in which they're described are not racialized, or uh, there may be class bias within them, but there isn't that kind of racial bias. Uh, the ways in which people of color are being constructed in these advertisements shows the development of, of concepts of racial difference and hierarchy. So there are, are those differences between the advertisements. The ambiguity, the legal ambiguity of slavery, yes. We see different law cases and decisions throughout the 17th and 18th century. And I would argue that even the Somerset case doesn't resolve this entirely. Um, but that's the whole point. Um, there is no ambiguity about slavery in South Carolina or Jamaica. Um, there is ambiguity in London. There is a space in which people from the colonies, from India, from the Caribbean, from the Americas, can bring enslaved people. And in many cases, the status of that person will not be challenged. So it's really between the enslaver, the master, and that person, how that relationship will be defined, because the law doesn't provide clear guidance saying, you can't do this, 
or you can do this. It's unclear. And it's that space that means it's so amorphous. But I would think what I've tried to argue is that because slavery doesn't look that bad compared to what's going on in the Caribbean and in the American South, because the kinds of work being done by enslaved people in London and the British Isles is relatively benign, the conditions of their enslavement look much more uh, moderate, we could be tempted to think, well, it's not as bad, it's not slavery. But again, I'll take you back to the example of Quashi, probably only about 12 years old when he's put on a slave ship. He is with Edward Archer, whose, whose initials are branded on his breast for four years, then Archer leaves on another slave voyage and he escapes. We can only imagine the trauma that boy has experienced. So mm. even if the conditions of his slavery are benign compared to the Caribbean, what he thinks his position is, what he thinks his freedom and rights are, is another matter. Um, and I think we have to try and imagine the, the mental world of someone who Archer clearly views as property. Um, his initials are branded on that boy. So I think the fact that the word slave isn't used that often shouldn't fool us. Certainly some of these people, and especially as we get into the mid to later 18th century, are on a path to freedom or in a, in a liminal state between slavery and freedom. Some, are, it, the advertisements talk about that they are bound and they're bound for a set period of years. But even that doesn't give them complete safety. Someone who is a bound servant in 1760 um, may still be a servant to someone who is going to Jamaica or back to India and takes that person with them. And what will they do with that person then? And if they choose to sell that person, um, are they really going to be challenged back in England? I found no cases where that happens. Um, clearly, the fear of being sent back is a motivating factor for some escapes. Um, so I think we have to be, you're right that, the, that slavery is ambiguous, but um, if we put, look at it from the perspective of the people who are enslaved or bound or in this amorphous state, it can be pretty bad and pretty frightening. And then labor law, um, labor law is vital in the colonies. Labor law is being rewritten in the context of the slave codes and the various legal apparatus for large numbers of white servants who are often treated very badly and then enslaved Africans and indigenous people. In England, I think labor law is far less relevant because to begin with, we're talking about a very small number. If we're looking at Jamaica, where I don't know, one in anywhere between one in eight to one in 12, one in 15 of the population is white, the vast majority are enslaved black laborers. Um, labor law is everything. The rewriting of labor law to justify and to make slavery the predominant labor form is everything. But given that most enslaved people in London, well, they're often young males who are working as household and domestic servants. Others are working on ships. Um, there are a few women, they're also working in domestic, uh, sometimes in inns and taverns. Um, they are, in the work they do, they are fitting into exactly the same labor structures that ex already exist. There aren't enough of them as, an as a group of enslaved people who can be owned to challenge the labor practices of white people. That's what's going on in America. The labor practices of white people are being uprooted and transformed by the existence of an ever expanding class of enslaved black laborers. So that's why I didn't really get into labor law because I didn't see it as, as being that pertinent to what the story I was telling. Thank you. Some very thorough, thorough answers to some um, important questions there. Um, there's a question in the chat from Christopher Curry, I think perhaps related. Um, he thanks you for the paper and asks, when do the adverts start to use the word belonging? The, the two early examples you used in the presentation didn't use that word. Is that significant or does it <clears> shift? <throat> Was it deliberately um, ambiguous earlier on? It, it's, well, I think it's ambiguous throughout the period that the word belonging can be used, it's sometimes used for white servants. 
who are skimmed. So I don't think it, it necessarily means enslaved. We might take belonging to mean is my property, but it could mean belonging to the household of and has escaped from the household of. So um, that's why I, in the database, I was very, we were very careful in delineating those we were absolutely positive were enslaved because so rarely is the language definitive or the evidence definitive. Um, words like belonging are used throughout the period, but they don't necessarily indicate en enslaved. Thanks. Interesting. Interesting point there. Um, it's probably time for one or two more questions from uh, Richard. Yeah, um, I thought that was a fantastic paper, but I have to say that this isn't my period. So any question that I ask may be completely loony. Um, but what I'm really trying to imagine is once you've run away, how you remain run away in London. So it's really a question, I suppose, about the free black community, or at least the, the <clears throat> black community that isn't regarded as liable to being retaken, and how easy it is to actually live a life mm. among those, uh, th those other black people without being easily apprehended. <clears throat> so could you say a Yes. whatever you can you can offer about that <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, again a really good question and um i i have to i cannot answer definitively because of course the whole point of a successful escape is that person disappears mm -hmm. i don't know um so okay my thinking on this is it, that Many of the freedom seekers, many of those who run, are relatively young and male. Um, some are boys, otherwise they tend to be young men, are very young men. Um, they may choose to enter domestic service, and there are enough advertisements of people who are free, who are advertising themselves, saying, I'm an experienced waiter, footman, can do all of the things that you want to indicate that there's clearly a market. And I do have a few runaways where someone has run away and it's then discovered to have been working as a free servant, doing exactly the same work for someone else for a salary. Um, so I think the fact that it's desirable to have young black personal servants means there's a market. So if you can get away, London's a big city, um, you can remain fairly, hopefully fairly anonymous and, and, and get away and, and do that work as a free black person. Also throughout the 17th and 18th century, as we all know that this is a period of almost not constant warfare, but there's a great deal of warfare. The, the Royal Navy and to a lesser extent, the army and the merchant Navy are desperate for manpower. Um, black sailors are incredibly popular. Uh, you send a ship down to West Africa or across to the Caribbean, you will probably lose, I don't know, Jenny, a quarter to a third of the crew, of a white crew, because of their exposure to, to West African and Caribbean tropical disease. Many people born in West Africa or South Asia have, have developed a degree of childhood immunity to those diseases. And although people don't understand why that's so, they know that Black sailors are more likely to survive. So the number of free and enslaved Black people serving on British ships is enormous. So that's the other thing you can do. Ship captains are not supposed to take people with, unless they have proof that they're free. They clearly do. Um, so that's the other. I, I think there are avenues to freedom. And then in terms of the support network of the Black community, I, I think it's not just the Black community. I think it's the white community too. Um, I was really struck, especially in the 17th century, it lessens a little in the 18th century, but not much, um, at the support of the white community. There are records of, a, uh, there are runaway advertisements that I can associate with records of baptism and church communities and sometimes court records that show church communities supporting a person who's been baptized in their bid for freedom. Um, there are enough records of interracial marriages 
to know that that's clearly going on too. So I think it's quite possible that there, it's that we don't we shouldn't think just about a black community providing shelter. That we should think of an interracial community of friends providing shelter, and that makes it more possible to escape. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that actually takes me back to the other key phrase that I'd mm -hmm. noted down to to discuss with you, which was again I might be paraphrasing slightly. London is the most important character in the story. Yes. <laughs> as, as a historian of London, mm -hmm. I guess my question is, yeah, how much is this a distinctively London story? Is this the uh, metropolis mm -hmm. offering the opportunity to disappear into the crowd in a way that wouldn't be possible in, say, Bristol or, or Glasgow? Um, how you, you've obviously worked on the, the Scottish situation mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. how, how does that compare? And perhaps are there are there comparable studies of, say, Amsterdam or Madrid or, or Barcelona of other cities where this phenomenon might might exist from right. question of ignorance? <clears throat> um, answering the last part first, not yet, but there are developing. There is some good work on Lisbon which of course had had a black population since really the 15th century and a fairly large black population. And many of the people there have become free. So um, that's probably the best example. Um, I'd, I'd, before I wrote this book, I'd written a, a long article on escaping from slavery in Jamaica. And the article was called Hidden in Plain Sight, because my argument in the end was in a, in a society in which so many people, such a high proportion of the population was enslaved, um, but that there was also a significant free Black community, that that made it actually very hard to find runaways, because you could ride from the middle of the island as a white person to Spanish town and Kingston and see on the course of that journey many hundreds of people and you had to assume that most of them were enslaved because if you stop to check every one of them, you'd never get to your destination. So that there was a way to stay. There were ways that it wasn't easy, it was dangerous, but it was possible to hide in plain sight. <laughs> I think something similar was possible in London, not because of a very large black population, it's a significant one, but it's not very large, but because of the size of the city and its diversity. And, um, I hadn't realized how racially and ethnically diverse London was and how there were people from all over Europe and increasingly from over from parts of Asia too, um, that this is an incredibly diverse, especially the maritime communities along the river, um, that that made me realize that the, the nature of London, its size, its population, um, the, the many opportunities made it possible for enslaved people who wanted to free themselves to do things that weren't possible in quite the same way in Philadelphia, weren't possible in rural areas of Britain. Um, I do have examples of people running away from Edinburgh or Glasgow and taking off for the Highlands. And you think, well, what? And they do it. And some of them are free for extended periods because we see advertisements saying they're still gone. Has anyone seen them? Who knows? Um, there's something interesting going on there that we'll never know. Fascinating. Yeah. It even struck me the particular areas uh, on your maps were areas that were familiar to me from 15th century records of alien migration, um, both the East End, but also the St. Sepulchre and then the area just towards yes. the, the west of the walls there. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, was there another question in the chat? There, there's a private the comment there from from graham carl for you in the yes. chat. Thank you. um <clears throat> any any other questions from the audience if not i might just make take the liberty of mentioning um another event organized by um a program that we've been collaborating with as part of the mayor of london's uh, commission for diversity in the public realm um, they've got a season of activities called London Unseen, which I think connects very closely with a lot of the themes we've been talking about. And next Tuesday, the 29th, uh, they have an event at uh, Colthorpe Community Gardens, which is near Grayson's Road, 
uh, called Looking for Black Mary, uh, a reasoning circle. Uh, it's organized by artistic director Gaylene Gold, um, and it's a mission to revive Black Mary's whole, a fabled 17th century healing well. Who was Black Mary? What happened to London's healing waters? And what would a healing centre for Londoners' communities look like today? Um, so take a take a Google for that if you're interested and you're around next Tuesday. London Unseen, looking for Black Mary, a reasoning circle. Seemed apt for uh, the kind of responses and the kind of uh, things we've been discussing today. And Adam has details of our next seminar as well. It's in the chat there. With... Yeah, um, just uh, so I, uh, since Peter Hansel is in the audience uh, tonight, I see. So Peter, if, <laughs> thank you, Peter. Um, Peter Hansel is uh, giving our first, I think it's our first ever hybrid event. Um, it's going to be Internet House and online. I hope this, I think that's right. If not, then don't worry about it. Um, which, uh, details of which I've just posted in the chat, uh, which is on a, a rather different aspect of London's history, but uh, in more with more physical, with more lasting physical consequences, perhaps. Um, looking at um, um, the clay zone of London, so the clay pits, brick fields, and townscape of 19th century London, um, all are welcome uh, to come along. Um, so thank you very much for your time, and uh, I look forward to seeing some more of you again later. And thank you, Simon, for an absolute thank you. thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much, Simon. That was absolutely wonderful paper. Thank you for um, giving up your time to come and speak to us. My pleasure. Thank you.